Hi, my name is Molly Crenshaw, and I'm a faculty member at Texas Christian University in Fort Worth, Texas. I specialize in undergraduate instruction of human anatomy and physiology. Today I'll be demonstrating for you how the Visible Body software program could be used during a typical class lecture. You can access body systems through this tab, Course Topics, which will lead you to the system we're going to cover today, the respiratory system. Now we are going to discuss the lower respiratory system, but I'll assume that you need a quick review of some of the structures we discussed with the upper respiratory system. As you can see here, the upper respiratory system is formed by the nasal cavity, the pharynx, which would receive air from both the nasal and the oral cavities, and then finally the larynx, which we discussed significantly as the homing place of your vocal system. As we lead into the structures of the lower respiratory system, we see they begin just inferior to this larynx. It includes first off the trachea, which subdivides into tiny tubules known as bronchi and bronchi bronchioles, all of these together forming what we know as the lungs. Let's begin by examining the trachea. His location is significant sitting at the anterior aspect of the chest and of the throat. It sits below the, the larynx and runs to the location of the fifth thoracic vertebra, where you can see it undergoes a bifurcation or a splitting into the components of the bronchial tree that we will examine in more detail in just a moment. Structurally, the trachea is unique due to the series of cartilaginous rings that line its length. These cartilaginous rings are formed with hyaline cartilage, which is both sturdy and flexible at the same time. If you run your finger along the front of your throat, you can feel the ridges formed by these cartilaginous rings. You'll also notice that the structure is anterior to the muscular esophagus. If we fade this esophagus and take a look in at this uh, posterior view of the trachea, you see these cartilaginous rings are not complete around the entire body of the trachea. By watching the video in tab 36.4, we see the significance of these many structures and how they contribute to the physiology of breathing. The trachea conveys air between upper and lower respiratory structures. This flexible tube extends from the larynx to the upper chest where it divides into the bronchi. Between 15 and 20 cartilaginous C-shaped rings keep the trachea from collapsing or overexpanding. The shape of these cartilaginous rings allows the trachea to change shape to accommodate masses of food passing through the esophagus. Smooth muscle of the trachea can contract to decrease its diameter, which allows air to be expelled out of the lungs more forcefully during coughing. The we will further examine the structures of the bronchial tree along with the physiology of breathing in a moment, but it's important to step back and take a look at the anatomy of the entire thoracic cage before we do so. In tab 36.5, you examine how the bronchial tree and the lungs are situated within the thoracic cage, which we've already discussed in earlier sections as being formed by the sternum anteriorly, the ribs, and then of course, posteriorly, by the vertebral column. You can see that the left lung and the right lung are situated so that they hug around the heart and then are bordered inferiorly by the diaphragm. Now by re-examining the heart, you'll notice that it does fit into a niche between the two lungs. And if we hide the heart, you'll notice there's a tiny series of holes sitting on the most medial aspect of both the right and the left lung. This begins our discussion of the anatomy of the lungs. So we'll begin first with the right lung. Housing all of the tiny tubules of the bronchial tree, the right lung is divided into what we know as three lobes, superior lobe, a middle lobe, and an inferior lobe. Now, these lobes are divided by what are known as fissures, which we can see here as the horizontal fissure and the oblique fissure. In comparison, we see the left lung is only divided into two separate lobes, a superior lobe and an inferior lobe, divided from one another by an oblique fissure. That hilum that we were discussing a second ago can be seen here if we look at the medial aspect of the right lung. It is this space here, and of course, this is a new term, so it's important to remember pronunciation. Root or hilum of lung. And by reviewing this book tab, you see here a simple description. 
The hilum being a triangular depression where structures that form the root of the lung enter and leave. By examining these structures, we see that first off, components of the bronchial tree, such as the primary bronchus and the diverging secondary bronchi, begin to enter the lung. But you also review structures of the cardiovascular system. Pulmonary arteries, as you will recall, convey deoxygenated blood from the right ventricle to the lungs. And then, of course, the pulmonary veins, which you see here, will return oxygenated blood from the lungs to the left atrium of the heart. That way, oxygenated blood can be distributed back through the systemic circuit. These are important components and help us review the entire functionality of the body as a whole. Now, before we examine what goes on inside the lungs, it's important to back up and to see how breathing movements associated with inhalation and exhalation actually enable us to oxygenate or deoxygenate the blood itself. We'll be examining what is known as Boyle's Law, associated with breathing um, as we would otherwise refer to as pulmonary ventilation. Pulmonary ventilation, or breathing, is induced by changes in the volume of the lungs and the air pressure within them. During normal inhalation, the diaphragm and external intercostal muscles contract and the ribcage elevates. As the volume of the lungs increases, air pressure in the lungs drops below atmospheric pressure and air rushes in. During normal exhalation, the muscles relax, the lungs become smaller, pressure inside them rises, and air is expelled. Boyle's Law explains this relationship between volume and air pressure. An increase in the volume of a container lowers the pressure of the air inside. A decrease in the volume raises pressure in the reduced space. The body's demand for more oxygen can change normal breathing to forced breathing. Additional muscles increase the changes in volume of the thoracic cavity so that more air can pass in and out more rapidly. This concept of an inverse relationship between your thoracic volume and thoracic pressure is, as you can see, what drives inhalation and exhalation. Now, it's important to review those muscles that we've discussed in earlier sections through anatomy and physiology. And you can review here using this tab that those muscles associated with inhalation, as you can see, include the diaphragm, the external intercostals, the sternocleidomastoid, the scalenes group, the pectoralis minor, and the serratus anterior, while those muscles associated with exhalation would include some duplicates, again the diaphragm and the external intercostals, but additionally internal intercostals, transversus thoracis, and your abdominal muscles. With those working together, you can facilitate pulmonary ventilation via the mechanism we've just learned as Boyle's Law. Let's return one more time to the bronchial tree and examine how air would flow through the many structures of the bronchial tree as you inhale and then exhale. Once again, you'll remember that the lower respiratory system begins with our cartilaginous trachea, bifurcating then into the two primary bronchi. And one thing you will notice here is that in the audio tab, I continue to use the word bronchi, which is plural, but here you will hear the word bronchus, primary bronchus, which is singular. Don't let the terminology confuse you. I need you to see the structural differences here between these many diverging bronchi, and so it's important to read through your book tab as we do so. You'll see here that like the trachea, trachea the primary bronchi are composed of incomplete rings of hyaline cartilage. However, you will see that they are slightly more narrow than the trachea. As you see them branch into what are known as secondary bronchi, you see that these begin to get even smaller than the primary bronchi. And you'll see that here, instead of cartilaginous rings, as it says, the secondary bronchi are supported by irregular plates of hyaline cartilage. As they branch into the tertiary bronchi, you see that once again, these are smaller structures that begin with only a slight amount of supportive cartilage and then run into what are known as bronchioles, even smaller structures that, as it says right here, contain no cartilage at all. The significance of these structures is that as they continue to get even smaller, they divert air 
into what we will eventually see here in this image are known as alveoli. If you'll follow along in the illustration, you can pick up where we left off at these tiny non-cartilaginous bronchioles, which begin to continue dividing into what are seen here as alveolar ducts. The alveolar duct giving way to this cluster known as an alveolar, alveolar sac containing many individual sacs known as alveoli. Now these are two terms that are often confused by students. So in order to review these on your own time, I would recommend creating a note card so that you can see the significance of the two structures. We'll begin here by underlining the term alveolar sac and alveoli, and we'll create a text box that reminds us of the following. An alveolar sac is composed of smaller individual alveoli. That way you can reference it later on in case you get confused. We'll save this note card, which we'll title alveolar sac. And we can review it later on by looking at this tab known as My Note Cards. But for now, we're going to continue on with our discussion of these structures. The alveoli here are significant because as you can see in this enlarged image, this is where the many diverting capillaries, arterioles, and venules from your pulmonary arteries and pulmonary veins are actually going to wrap around the lungs. This forms something that we know as the respiratory membrane, which we can see in tab 3611. This respiratory membrane is important for the exchange of gases between the blood and the alveoli. If we take a look at tab 37 and respiration, after we've looked at the muscles of exhalation, you can review using this video here in tab 37.5 which facilitates the process known as external respiration, taking place at the respiratory membrane. Inside the lungs, oxygen from the air is exchanged for waste carbon dioxide from the bloodstream. This process of external respiration takes place in hundreds of millions of microscopic sacs called alveoli. Oxygen from inhaled air diffuses from the alveoli into the pulmonary capillaries surrounding them and is pumped through the bloodstream. Carbon dioxide from oxygen-depleted blood diffuses from the capillaries into the alveoli and is expelled through exhalation. This is going to conclude our discussion of the lower respiratory system for today, but as you can see, we still have a multitude of material we need to cover in future class periods. In order to make sure you're prepared for this, there are a few ways that I would recommend that you study. To begin with, you can return back to the note cards that you would make through the system and review those. Here's our alveolar sac note card that we just made a second ago. Studying these can help you review concepts so that you can master them. Then to check your knowledge of material, you can take individual quizzes. The quiz tab here in the top left hand corner is going to be divided based on body system and of course by quiz type. You see that you can take a multiple choice quiz which I would highly recommend doing first. And then once you've mastered your multiple choice quiz, you can take a dissection quiz where you begin to identify all the anatomy that we've just covered in this course. Best of luck to you as you study, and I look forward to continuing on with our discussion of the respiratory system in further lectures. I hope this has helped you see how to walk through use of the Visible Body Software program and how beneficial it can be both in class and during individual student study time. Thank you.